want to say thank you for coming tonight. It's a very special evening, and uh, uh, I think we're in for a real special treat uh, with Calvin Henry tonight. Uh, but first, I want to say a quick thank you to Lori Day and the rest of the church committee to allow us to be here tonight. This is a wonderful venue, so thank you, Lori. We're, we're no here. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, so we're going to listen to Calvin Henning tonight uh, talk about uh, his encountering of James Fitzgerald starting at the time when he worked with the Huberts uh, back in the early 80s to do the first biography. Uh, but there's a lot more to it than that. Calvin's always had a lot of insight. Now, I want to talk a little bit about his professional choices and, and positions and also his educational choices because sometimes you look at someone who has a particular perspective and it's interesting to look back and see how did they get there, what was their path. Um, but um, as well, this, this talk tonight is very special for two reasons. First of all, it's the first lecture in the new established Edward LDC Endowed Lecture Series uh, that we started last year uh, in commemoration for Ed to uh, honor his commitment and dedication to the museum. So we want to say thank you, Ed, Thanks. for all that you've done, and we look forward to many lectures every summer uh, from here on. So thank you. I think it's really appropriate that we have a Fitzgerald-related lecture to start this series because Ed was so involved with the Huberts over the years and was very involved with Anne when she decided to give the gift to the museum. So it's all very connected. Um, and the other reason it's really special this year is we have the exhibition at the museum, and it's James Fitzgerald, of course. And hopefully you've had a chance to get up there. If not, you will. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to Emily Gray here for being the primary curator and doing an amazing job. It's beautiful. So thank you. For being here. So on to Calvin. So um, Calvin comes with a very unique and, and interesting perspective and uh, I'll just kind of, you know, I can read a resume, but you know, so what? But um, when I do read your resume and when we chat, um, it's interesting to see. So Calvin started, got his uh, bachelor's in philosophy and uh, considered it going on and getting his master's in philosophy, but felt that that might not be fully all of his interest. So he goes to Europe and rides a motorcycle around Europe for a summer with a friend of his just to look at art sleeping in the fields and just camping it out, but really getting into art and history and architecture and um, decides that that's his path. And he then gets his master's through Syracuse <coughs> University and has a fellowship at the Uffizi Gallery in Florence and also does his master's thesis in that area. So um, goes on to be a popular professor in various places. I hope, um, I'm sure that's true. Um, <laughs> And then uh, is a curator at, uh, at the Jocelyn in Omaha, Nebraska, which was your hometown, I believe, and was a very important museum as a young person growing up, so that's a nice connection. And then was a uh, the curator at the Portland Museum of Art, of Art in Maine. Uh, I think that's about the time that the Huberts and you connected, I believe. Um, and that was right about the time that you had gone back for your PhD in humanities and, and art history. So. You know, on paper, it's one thing, but really, I think that speaks to such a unique and interesting choice, uh, and, and the way that you've chosen to proceed with your life. And and uh, I think when I when I first met Calvin, it really was through the, the first documentary. I read the book when you when you wrote it uh, in the mid '80s when it first came out, but it was the documentary that I I saw this person who was part of the documentary with the Huberts as well, of course, but. Uh, the way Calvin spoke about the artwork and the man, I thought, here's somebody who's very intelligent, but very sensitive, and very open to what is happening. What is Fitzgerald offering? And, and I've come to feel that there is something special, that there is a special choice or process and offering that the artist is making, and I think more than many artists, because he was so committed to his work, and uh, that's what we're exploring uh, at the Odyssey of James Fitzgerald exhibition this year. So I was really thrilled when I asked Calvin to, if he'd be willing to talk about these issues. And because it's what he was doing before, he's always had a, a wonderful sense of who this person is and, and giving a lot of great insight. So I was thrilled when he agreed to do that. 
And um, so I think we're in for a real treat tonight. I won't say any more, uh, but I'd just like to welcome Calvin and say thank you very much. And I think we're in for a real treat. So thank you. Special regards to Ed DC, special honor to him. Uh, he was here right from the very beginning for me. So, uh, what you hear here involves him kind of embroidered all the way through, actually. So, it seems very fitting. Uh, a word about the, the, the works of art here. Uh, uh, um, uh, I had not uh, framed this, uh, this talk around images, visual images, nor these particular works. We thought that it was a little silly to be talking about art without something up. So, so we put these up, and so a few of them will refer to uh, as we go along. And just for your delectation, uh, their wonderful broad selection, which is uh, very much in keeping with this general movement, which, uh, which was broad indeed. Um, certainly, we can uh, do some uh, answering questions after this is over. But, uh, but also, it might be fun just to, after it's over, come up and chat and look at these things and have discussion about them uh, uh, together. It's a nice way to learn and it's also, I always like that because I know what I feel about works and I'm more interested in what somebody else feels about them. So in any event, um, uh, I hope that's enjoyable to you and, and we'll start from there. Um, in speaking with Dan uh, some weeks ago, we hit on the theme for, the, for this talk, which is encountering James Fitzgerald, um, which is how, how I became involved with Jim in the first place. Uh, and how it led to producing the first published biography. Uh, I like the idea of that for, for the reason that I taught art history for a good many years, and I didn't want to do that format again. I, so often, it's image after image after image, and, and I, I've grown tired of it, uh, actually. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's, it's really true that the, that the book uh, uh, was a symbol of importance of launching, and launching that, 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 that uh, that helps us to get here today talking about this show. But the truth of it is, honestly, I stand between two mountains. Uh, one of them, on one side, are the Huberts, uh, who, who uh, with the enormity of work that Ed and Ann put into this from scratch, organizing and promoting Fitzgerald for the entire latter part of their lives. Um, uh, that is one thing that I'm, obviously, they were before me, and their credit stands for, uh, certainly for everything that I did. And then the second, actually, is the work of the Fitzgerald legacy, and especially Bob Stahl, who, as you know, produce, has produced an incredible uh, catalog resume. The second volume is, is due out very soon, very soon, we keep saying. Uh, so um, that, of course, furthers this. So I'm standing, I think, very much between the two of these. Um, and if you've not seen it, uh, I'd like to recommend something to you, which is a video you may find online of a, of a, a lecture uh, that that uh, Robert gave to the Mayer Museum of Randolph College in May of this year. It is absolutely excellent. Uh, I certainly recommend it. Randolph College. Um, my knowledge does not approach Bob Stahl's, nor probably never did, uh, actually. Um, uh, and uh, he'll, since he's going to be speaking a few days from now, it's even a little silly for me to give an art history lecture on Jim Fitzgerald. <laughs> since, since, since you're going to hear this again, I have a feeling. So the truth of it is that my talk tonight is really a story. Uh, it's a story among others that uh, has led us to the recognition of Jim Fitzgerald's well-deserved importance uh, in the art of this island and in California and beyond, actually. Um, uh, and it would be, actually, it wouldn't make very much sense to give this kind of casual talk anywhere else because Fitzgerald's life, his life was so embroidered with the life of this island. Uh, so it could be considered simply as a bit of added history, uh, and that helps give color to Fitzgerald's legacy, and, uh, and so we begin. Still shy of a PhD, I came to Portland in 1979 as a curator of collections uh, um, uh, at the Portland Museum of Art, of course, and had had museum experience before coming, uh, and also some years in teaching, uh, college teaching, actually, and although my specialty is, is as uh, revealed, uh, it's not necessarily a specialty in American art. It's quite broad. Um, after a period of adjustment, probably about a year or so, um, I was called into the office of the director, who told me he'd been approached by a couple who lived in Dover, Massachusetts.
Massachusetts, and they wanted to give some paintings to the museum uh, uh, that were done by a friend of theirs on Monhegan Island. Now, and, and uh, this, this particular artist is now deceased. So, um, uh, the Huberts, by the way, also had a house on, uh, on the island. Would I contact them? Would I set up a meeting? Uh, and I was uh, very eager to do so. But, um, if one works for a, for a pretty prestigious museum, if you're a curator at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, um, likely at this kind of meeting, at the end of it, you're going to see a treasure coming at you. But the smaller museums, that's not always the case. Um, and I have done that before, and I've done it before this offer from, uh, from the director. Usually, usually you find good works, but oftentimes not lesser quality. And of course, that, that's a little, uh, a little difficult because people are obviously proud of the works they have. So I wasn't sure what I was getting into, naturally. The, um, um, the, uh, the Huberts were not known to the staff, uh, and nor was uh, uh, Fitzgerald's work to, to, to any great extent, and so this was something of an exploration. So it was on a, I remember it was on a fair weather day um, uh, in probably in late spring. I drove to Dover and was treated to a, to a lunch and very warm welcome uh, um, by the Huberts. And parenthetically, the backyard fronted a very generous pond. Uh, Anne had told me that they never wanted to live anywhere that was not away from water. So, and getting through the back door, you, you went through a, a flower garden on either side, a raised flower garden that Anne tended very carefully, and it was quite beautiful, actually. Um, uh, so, in any event, there was a decorative easel that was, uh, that was at the end of the, the living room. Uh, I, I, I have to ask the, the people here in the know, but I think it belonged to Jay Conway. Uh, I'm not sure, but it was a beautiful easel, and who, who actually in his uh, years at Monhegan had actually exhibited it at Bose Gallery, uh, as did uh, Jim Fitzgerald. Wonderful natural light, I remember that, coming in through, through the curtains on the deck uh, off of the backyard. Yeah, Ed and you, which some of you know here, very silently, the painting stack, of course, very silently, uh, put, put a pink picture on the painting on the easel and leave it there for a considerable amount of time. Um, uh, this occurred over and over again, and with a good deal of silence, except for some narrative comments by Anne. She would, uh, she would talk about Jim, talk about his philosophy of art, talk about maybe some specific content uh, in the work itself. Uh, and so what was on display? All right, so this is the richest of the riches that I, that I ran into when I was there. Um, Monhegan in winter, well, uh, that right over there, second one here to, to your right. I, I, I was absolutely not over by that painting. This is obviously, this is obviously dimmed down and there's, there's, a, there's a shield over the top of it. But I couldn't, it was breathtaking to me to see that painting. Uh, it just sang of that day. Mermaid Rose was here at the very back. Uh, that was there, uh, obviously painted in California. Uh, and a similar work that we all know because that is how uh, Ann Huber fell in love with, uh, with Ed, uh, with, uh, with uh, James Fitzgerald, and how James Fitzgerald fell in love with Ann and that started all of this actually. Uh, Coast in Winter, of course, was also California. East River was, um, was from New York. Snow Ice and Water was from Vermont and that is here from Vermont, uh, Home by Moonlight, uh, which, is, uh, which is not here, but that's now in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Trout Stream, Boats of Monhegan, we, that, where are we here? I'm not in the reflections. It's the first one. Are we? Boats of Monhegan, right here. Right here, sorry, yeah, it's the reflection. Boats of Monhegan. And then there's also Storm Cloud to come, and, uh, and Burgess to come. Few of the paintings. Uh, Storm Cloud particularly appeal to me. Uh, and, and still does. It's a, it's a thrilling work. Oxen, the two oxen pulling uh, was there. I never knew if it was sunset or sunrise. Pinks on those oxen. Oxen and the, the, the sensitivity of one to another, the, the affection for them was just so touching. Among my favorites, too, was a, a painting of a rhododendron, a flower in Anne's bedroom, which was absolutely lush. And I did, it was my mermaid roses, I thought. I thought uh, there would be a painting that that, uh, that would do it for me if I were in the studio. Well, okay, I was deeply, deeply struck by what I saw, uh, and I'm I'm sure that I said some appropriate things. But um, the truth of this is that so much of this was really unexpected. I don't know if I was terribly vocal. Uh, I, I really wasn't I was stunned, mm -hmm. but I had to be careful. Uh, I had to be careful because uh, I was I was. Uh, 
I had to speak for myself. I could only, I could only go a little way to speak for the museum because that would be another step, the director and, and, a, and a board, etc. Um, so it was, a, it was an exploratory assignment, I guess. And so uh, uh, all I could do was, of course, show great appreciation, which I did. The shell paintings made an palpable impact. Here was marked variety on display. Some certainly you can see here. Masterful composition, vibrancy where needed. Um, great differences in color and tonal range from one to the other. Uh, this was not the same song, second verse by any means. But for all of that, something more. And, and that you seem to hear a lot about James Fitzgerald, something more. Uh, I don't, I get this memo even say it because I still feel this. I don't think it's extreme to say that I was receiving something more, a thought, a life of consequence perhaps, a searching, uh, and there were echoes of, of an inner peace that part in so many of the works uh, that, that read through them. Um, uh, and even, even those that often had great activity in them, there was some stillness about them. And even that's what I felt when I saw the works. So, paraphrasing uh, the foreword to the exhibition catalog by Marius Pellido, then director of the Farnsworth Library and Art Museum, no one who knew Fitzgerald ever came away without a definite impression of the man, and no one sees his oils and watercolors, is likely to mistake them as by somebody else. Those of you who know Fitzgerald certainly know that. He was his own man, writes Pellido, and spoke with his own voice. Well, I returned to the museum, wrote a glowing report recommending the paintings, but most of the first, fortunately, there was no action taken. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, probably because, but certainly might have been the finalizing plans for the new building that was going up in court for the museum, uh, which uh, had uh, drained off a lot of uh, staff time. The director and some staff were flying back and forth to Manhattan, leading architects into, into, uh, into Portland, and a professional fundraiser had also been, been hired uh, and so that was taking up staff time as they went and talked to, uh, to various donors. <laughs> About a half a year later than that, I, later, later, I resigned. And I, I uh, took a, I moved to Boston and took a job with a fine arts consulting firm. And then after that, I became promotion manager of a book company uh, that collected and distributed art exhibition catalogs to universities and municipal libraries in this country and globally. Uh, and uh, I stayed there a number of years and was, and was still there uh, when I completed uh, my, my degree. I believe it was in late winter, we're going back here to when I'm moving to, to Boston, late winter uh, in Boston, that I wrote a card to Hubert. And uh, I recalled our visit, telling Anne that I would really like to visit them in spring time, that uh, I wanted to enjoy their company again, and I certainly wanted to, to see that garden. And uh, I, I, I still remember this, it seemed like the next day I got a response, and it was something like, spring schmink, how about this weekend? <laughs> so that started, actually. Uh, the, it was a warm, close friendship, many casual meetings, dinners at their home visits to the Museum of Fine Arts, of course, and much discussion about Fitzgerald all the way along, uh, and of course, even a visit or two to Mike Egan. Throughout all of this, for professional reasons, I avoided discussion of the Portland Museum because of their lack of interest it would seem uh, in their nascent offer, um, and praised the museum for its, for its work on, on uh, their expansion of physical space, which of course was needed and has been uh, much applauded and helpful. So at last, the Huberts invited me out to a lunch and formally sat me down, formally asked me to write a book on Fitzgerald. They thought about it for a long time, they said, they felt it was necessary for his greater exposure, and he could do more than piecemeal work of showings on the island as they could, as you know, they did regularly, and gallery exhibitions here and there as were possible. I said no, uh, and as much as I wanted to help them, I'd been working on my doctoral exams and my dissertation for years, and working full time as well, and I, which I just completed, and I, I, I was honestly, weary of research. I, I just didn't, <laughs> I didn't know if I wanted to tap on more. But I offered to connect them with some qualified uh, specialists uh, in the field who would be eminently qualified to produce a biography, and I had several in mind, in fact. So about six months later, uh, Ann and Ed invited me uh, to, to their house, sat me down again, this time with greater resolve. 
Okay, if I didn't read the book, they might not go further, they said. And because of, they knew of my love for Fitzgerald's work, they would trust the process more with me than someone else. And they were certain it would be in the decision Fitzgerald would approve of. They were good friends by this time, and biography was clearly needed, and I consented. Luckily, Ed broke out a bottle of champagne, which they did on Mark on occasions, as you know, he was ready, ready with that all the time. The next question was what, uh, what arrangement or terms would I require of them, which of course meant my cost for all the writing of the manuscript, the scene, carrying through the details right at the very end. Well, I told them I would take no money, but if in the process I were out of the writing they wished to give me a painting by Fitzgerald of their choosing, uh, uh, that, would be, so that would be sufficient. And so it began. The Huberts uh, had a good relationship with Marius Pelago uh, at the Farnsworth, and the museum was happy to serve as the publisher. The entire publication, of course, was, was heavily subsidized by the Huberts. My work on the biography took one year, and since I was employed full time, it was a matter of nights and weekends and vacations, and a good portion of the time spent in their basement. Remember that Fitzgerald saved very few letters and uh, exhibitions, uh, notices of exhibitions from his early life, and of course did a lot to put in his later life. Uh, and uh, uh, some of you remember that she had collected and assembled uh, all that was useful, and would remember also a rank of files, about eight, eight of them uh, in the basement, all chopped and blocked with Fitzgerald, uh, with Fitzgerald notes. Um, by the way, that, that, those, that, rank, that rank of files was against the wall on the other side of which and Hubert, that was his frame shop. He had taught himself framing, the craft of framing, and uh, and and uh, uh, and, uh, and they also had in there file cabinets, of course, for drawings and watercolors. It, it was it, it was kind of, I guess, kind of funny to me. But Ed was so serious about it, he would don an apron, and he, he had he had actually printed a, a work order, and he would fill in his work order, you know, almost like a like a short order cook, and he'd hang it up, and then he, and then he would. <laughs> Would follow through with it. It was absolutely perfect. It was absolutely precise. Um, especially dear to me uh, were times here on the island and in the camp house. Um, uh, the inside uh, just exuded tremendous warmth, and, and the accumulated history that went way back in the early days of Rockwell Kent. His, his willful rocking chair, which we talked about, that moved to the left, is uh, was very, very much uh, uh, Rockwell Kent. Uh, his piano, um, the glass bowl that Mermaid Roses was in in California, uh, sat near the, near the window in their living room. Uh, horses from California, there was a neat drawing of Pequod by Kent in the bedroom, which was astounding. And some of you who, who, who remember the sweet Mary Kelsey Hutch that the Huberts, uh, Huberts that you would recognize that, that name. Um, fire in the fireplace, uh, long sunsets over the meadow. Uh, uh, with uh, spectacular sunsets beyond, uh, uh, it just added to it. And some of the times I remember most fondly uh, were, were the conversations with Anne, sitting outside in the dark near, uh, there was an old cherry tree next to the garden, uh, and it'd gone late into the night, and uh, I felt every bit, and I'm really sincere about this, like a Rockwell Kent illustration of Moby Dick, <laughs> looking out at that chill night air. And, uh, and sitting there with the stars so crisp and pure, it, it had all it had all the power that, that uh, Kim would envision. It, it, it's, it's, its darkness was uh, it's just absolutely indelible, and it seemed fit because um, the house wasn't electrified by at that time, so you were really out in, in the raw nature in the stars. So uh, those times and, and memories of the island. In creating the manuscript, chronology was the first hurdle. Where was the man and when? It was, it was hard to know. Records we had, uh, works done, notes on them, and phone calls, uh, all needed in as much as we could manage it to pin down where he was so we could find out what kind of a rhythm he had in his life. Information in the files, transfer to note cards for easy management. Um, all of that happened, and it had to do with mannerisms he had and notes about philosophy and whatever that he was going to remember. The, devil, the hard part for me about the biography, actually, where, where I felt like there were two pendulums that were swinging here. One of them was his chronology, 
So if that was here, so we pinpointed, you know, years and said, the other one was the non chronological stuff. What do you think about religion? What do you think about color? What, all of these things have to be interspersed. And where do you do that to make a book that's readable and balanced? And that's pretty hard when the whole first part of his life is, is, uh, uh, is not exactly available to you. But that was kind of uh, my task, and I remember that as uh, quite clearly a, a, a something that I needed to accomplish. One thing I could not fit in was his, this is um, this is this is true, and I remember it. He, he distrusted computers, and I couldn't get it in the book. Uh, this was the you know, late fifties. Vacuum tubes were going out. Transistors were coming in, and mainframes were coming in. Great big, you know, buildings. And he even then he was he was he said this is there's something wrong here. It's going to sap individuals of their humanity. It's going to make them less dependent upon themselves. It's going to it's going to uh, it's going to ruin uh, interrelationships between people, you know, and all of that is there, and it's that round piece that it, I just couldn't fit it in. It seemed like the book wasn't going to be right if I did that. There wasn't a spot for that, for that to be tossed in. But we now know it, so here it is. <laughs> um, uh, there were two guests in the basement, and gave me one, and so the actual manuscript wasn't written there. I wrote it in libraries. Um, I wrote uh, a good part of it in the Boston Public Library, the Law Library at, uh, uh, at uh, Boston College. They didn't seem to mind that I wasn't a law student. I walked in, ambled in, and wrote some biography. And some of the other uh, libraries that were around, uh, regional libraries around Dover, and typed the copy that I, I would write out, and she typed it out, and, and, and uh, Ruth uh, uh, edited it uh, uh, here uh, as, as I went along. And I recall photographing some of the works in their basement as well, uh, had it set up in the and so forth. A friend of the trained designer, Sarah Bowie, who I had known from a museum fellowship, worked as the publish worked with the publisher on the layout of the book, as I think beautifully done. Um, and um, uh, it went well. The only thing that was that was a bit of a glitch was a number of things were sent to a copy center, including quite a batch of Rockwell Kent's original letters, and one of them didn't come back. And there was no way we could trace the contents. And so uh, uh, one always wonders, of course, uh, but um, that, that got away from us. Uh, returning to the biography production for, for now, uh, there was a last minute problem. Uh, we uh, just talked with somebody who knew St. Clair pitching. Um, there was a, uh, an exhibition schedule that had already been set up um, uh, of three museums uh, for, uh, for a traveling show of Fitzgerald. Uh, the library, the Farnsworth Library and Art Museum, that was September of 1984. That was going to be followed by the Decordova and Dana Museum and Park, let me be sure I get that right, in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Finally, the Monterey Museum, Peninsula Museum in California. The book was never intended to be an exhibition catalog. It was to accompany this show and be available at various sites. The holdout of Sinclair Pitchings. Uh, the author of the introduction, who was keeper of prints at the Boston Public Library. Sinclair repeatedly missed deadlines, uh, and so the book could not go to press, and this greatly agitated the head man. And we're thinking about trying to, at the last minute, find someone else to write that introduction when it came through. And glad that we really were. It's a, it's a tremendously off the cuff, uh, uh, right, right hitting the nail on the head about Fitzgerald, that's eminently readable and a fine introduction to the biography. Well, so much for my encounter with James Fitzgerald and the Huberts. Uh, I believe the book did what it was, they intended, what we wished it would do to get him into the literature on a scale hard to accomplish without book, and serve as a further basis for scholarship and for exposure. And since the book was a biography, uh, uh, as much as an art history text, it allowed for a generous handling of the artist's thought, the workings of the inner man, and for the remaining time, I'd like to shift briefly and talk about that, to revisit that. The two major influences on Fitzgerald are well known. Asian philosophy from the East and Cezanne from the West. When you think about that, it's not exactly a likely pairing. For Cezanne, it was the incredible compositional necessity, no doubt, um, that he achieved. Also, the dynamic use of forces uh, and movement that he created, and oftentimes, the, the, imbalances that he created, plates that weren't round, uh, arms that were lower than they should be, uh, fruit rolling off a table, uh, uh, skewed skewed angles for tables and, and, uh, and uh, 
table of laws uh, in incredible order. Uh, um, often the imbalances, of course, make sense artistically. They seem to explore to me how human vision worked. It was, it was, a, it was really a, a look inward as much as, as outward. Um, uh, and how could, how did human vision translate the world to us? How could it translate the world to us? Um, Paintings were an investigation, in other words, and that's something akin to Fitzgerald, who, who not, not saying that this is a direct hangover from Cezanne, but Fitzgerald himself did not want to be called an artist. He wanted to be called an experimenter. Uh, and, uh, and that does make sense. So, uh, you're obviously not going to recognize stylistic similarities between, between Cezanne and Fitzgerald. It's look hard to find that. Now, uh, I have something I want to pass out. This is not exactly going to be caught on caught on, on video, but I've got one for this side, one for another side. It's a, it's a, it's a picture that I took of a, of, a, of a portrait that's hanging in the Museum of Fine Arts by Um, um Let's see. Every time this show went to Boston, he stood in front of this painting, he would tell Anne and Ed for an hour or more, looking at it, absorbed in it. Um, uh, I'm sorry to say this because some of you haven't seen it, but you, you, you keep it in mind. It's a Jesuit theologian whose name is Fray Cedis Cortesio Palacino. He was an uh, orator, uh, he was a, a Jesuit, uh, and, uh, uh, and also uh, a friend of El Greco's. And by the way, it entered the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts with the recommendation of John Singer Sargent in the early 1900s. Uh, in it, one finds a dynamic, flame-like movement of the, of the white robe, as you'll see, the leading up. Um, uh, forces set about by the off-center chair that was there. Um, one hand tense, he's holding it uh, as if he's, he's trying to hold a page in a book. The other hand is relaxed. I say relaxed, but I'll tell you that the tension in that man, I would watch out for that, that hand that's relaxed, because uh, it's going to get you, uh, it would seem to me. Plus, it, it's just a penetrating movement psychological nature of, uh, this, of the subject. Um, uh, it's a play of forces and forms, of course, that probably captured it. But the truth of the matter is, if you go to Boston and you're, and you're in front of that painting, the fun part is to see, you're going to see it here. What was it that drove this man, Fitzgerald, over and over again? What did he find there? Asian philosophy, sensitivity, the thought that influenced Fitzgerald cannot be emphasized too much. And it seemed likely he had an affinity for this very early on. Uh, naturally, this is speculation, but one wonders why shortly after his formal training in Massachusetts Normal Art School, later the Massachusetts College of Art, and the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, that Fitzgerald decided to head to Sri Lanka. What was it? Uh, was this just an adventure? He had many of them. He had gone to, uh, to the Caribbean. Uh, was it something about the landscape that got him? Or was it because the official religion was the state, official state religion was Buddhism uh, that had been introduced to Sri Lanka in the third century BC, BCE, and uh, today 70% Buddhist and 12% Hindu. So that may have been a draw early on. Um, certainly, however, it was in Monterey, California, uh, where he ended up that fostered and heightened uh, uh, his quest to uh, for into uh, look into Asian thought. Waves of this were coming across the Pacific, and one need to look no further than the presence of Jiddu Krishnamurti uh, to prove it. He was a few years younger than, than James Fitzgerald, loosely connected to, to the group that included, we all know, John Steinbeck, um, uh, John Steinbeck, um, Ed Ricketts, Jefferson uh, Robbins, uh, Robbins, the, uh, uh, the uh, Jeffers, excuse me, Jeff Robbins and Jefferson poet, uh, and so forth. Christian Marie was trying to explore uh, human interrelationships, but also meditation. Uh, he took a huge holistic view of, uh, of all of this, and he, he, he wanted more than anything to change, uh, for individuals to look into their own psyche to see if it could be changed. So I, I always wonder how much uh, Fitzgerald's contact with him was, because there's something there, and it probably be in any event. Also, Fitzgerald was building a library that was weighted heavily with Asian philosophy and poetry and efforts to secure Chinese ink, as you all know, blocks that were made in the 18th century. So what was all this for? What was he trying to capture? 
getting at the answer to this has to do with non-dual philosophy, a non-dual approach to phenomena. So forgive me for a second to, to be going into a kind of, uh, perhaps a, a lower level primer, but it might help. Um, in the West, we live among objects, individual objects, each with its own identity. But Eastern thought, in Eastern thought, there's a spiritual force or an Elan, Elan, present in everything. Its timeless presence is of a higher reality than the physical component, yet both are in, 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 inherent in the object. So you have both. In the West, one and one make two. In the East, one and one make two, but also one. That one is a single spirit that is through everything. And so you link with that. So we're all one, and yet what makes the second part of that, what makes the hard part, is the physicality of stone, of wood, and also the intrusion of our own wills, our own egos, and things that we have that block us from that. And so the idea, which is a noble pursuit, is to try to get to that core. And so this is what I'm thinking that, that certainly is inherent in his library and in many of his works as well. So, um, how does this mental spiritual stuff work? How does it work in the, in the framework of art? Well, by reading the subjects uh, of what is non-essential, there's a possibility of revealing the spirit. At best, it's something that can be felt, a sense of presence. It might be light or it might be overpowering. Um, uh, and I, I just have to point out something here, you know, something of this nature. You can see what has been subtracted here. You know, the presence of this, certainly, and we'll talk perhaps a bit about also snow, light, ice, and water, which becomes so, so seminal. Perhaps it comes down to nothing more than a, than a, than a different type of awareness uh, of, of approaching objects, but I think it's more. And likely, the meditative approach of Chinese or Japanese calligraphers, where you sit and meditate for hours before you begin uh, your, your task, um, it cannot be done, this capturing, unless the maker, the artist, senses and feels it. And Fitzgerald actively pursued a commitment to strengthen his spiritual physical and mental faculties, that's very well known. And his art can't really be fully appreciated without understanding that. And also, what the life of the mind meant to him, his library was clean over and over again. It contained works by the giants of Western philosophy as well, Western thinking. The very fact that he has repeated delvings into this, um, these resources, um, over and over again, has a monastic feel to it. It just does. He, he, it was a prized treasure, and he, and he went over it and took notes and wrote into linear in it uh, and, and with a real, a real devotion. And certainly, it was a quest. But it, it, you have to think about this. There's a lot of time spent on this, and it's something of the essence of the man. To get a feeling of the essence, the non essentials had to be paired away, as we talked about. The seminal moment was snow, ice, and water, which, which is here, uh, which. Um, uh, uh, which uh, I can, don't even need notes for this. He's coming, he's in Vermont. He sees this uh, at late night, late dusk. Uh, he's heading back to his lodgings, and something is indelible. He sees something that registers. He's ready for that. You know, he's prepared for this. He sees this, and he goes back to his lodgings, and he wakes up the next morning, and he paints it from memory. And what's not there are things that are not essential. What's there is what's essential. And so, not only is that the truth of it, it seems, but also that there's a balance of forces here. This is water that is, that is transitioning to ice or the other way around. It is the same, obviously, element, but it's in a state of transition. And the rest of this, of course, a beautiful painting, but the rest of this, of course, again, is cut down to the bare minimum. And to me, one of the most thrilling things, actually, philosophically, is you, the source of this, source of this is, uh, is, is hidden from you. You can't see that it's coming from the ridge up on the hill, but you see it in the water because it's here. So it's almost as if whatever is giving you that divine spirit or this creation is, is, is reflected here, and it's not, it's not something you're going to be seeing. Whitman does this too when he talks about this ferry ride across, uh, across the East River and in some of his poetry, the reflection, and how temporary it is and how important. Um, uh, Let's see. Um, this was noted, by the way, as this change, because he was not going to be painting uh, on, on site much longer. He was going to be painting in his studio, but he was going to be perfect spot. So his style changed, and, uh, and it was 
was noted in California, in this particular uh, review in the Del Monte Gallery in, uh, in Monterey, uh, Monterey, I believe, says that, um, uh, talks about what's happened in the change. And the quote here is, if you are already familiar with the work of the watercolorist James Fitzgerald in Montgomery, this show will have a special interest for you. The surprise for the Fitzgerald worshiper, kind of like that, because it was happening back then, uh, lies in the shocking realization that almost every picture is a new version uh, of an old composition. Fitz seems to have dug deep into the racks and files of his work, which date back long, long ago, in fact, into the New England period. The well-known California ranch horses are, are here again, this time presented with, by the new Fitzgerald, capitalized, uh, with all his newfound wisdom and deep understanding. Okay? But whatever has happened to Fitzgerald, it ain't love. Fitzgerald himself, in his search for fundamental truths, has tossed out so much that is rich and warm and human that what remains to carry on into his work puts it, def puts it definitely on the verge of sterility. Unquote. Well, okay. Prior exhibition at the gallery uh, uh, by the reviewer that says, uh, says this. And he's praised, in fact, for giving over to the, to the moods of, uh, of the waters, it's sh the ocean, its shallow waters, its quiet bays um, uh, and, uh, uh, and harbors, it says. Um, um, uh, young, quoting here, young, a thinker with talent and a great love for his chosen subject, Fitzgerald should travel far, uh, unquote. Jim's incredible draftsmanship in the early days of size as elements are stripped to essentials. But design, com composition, and astute observation remain. His early training put it in, uh, put it there, and, and it's obviously well founded. He was breaking new ground here, and I'm delighted to hear the comment that, affir that affirms his search for fundamental truths, which is very much in keeping with what we know about the man. Quotes about uh, re referencing Fitzgerald's non-dual quest, and uh, this work of tapping and presenting a sense of the spiritual through humans and through nature. One must think at the back of the mountain as you paint it. Um, and, in, and in listening to the wind rustling the wings of ravens, he was asked uh, by a young girl what he was looking at, and the quote was, the essence of it. He responded, Peter Burma, whose child it was, uh, um, observed this, uh, what this, his comment seemed to encapsulate Fitzgerald's entire life namely, a search for essentials and a concern for nothing less. Another one, standing on the rocks, one can sense their, their support descending way into the deep, Jim said. It gives the look of water a special gravity, too. So here we are. Um, but to follow this path fully required solitude, and Jim, in island life, became more of a loner. Perhaps the tendency was there before. He was given solitude as a child and a large family so that he could work. He found great solace in the, in the woods and the streams and back of his grandparents' home in Milton, Massachusetts. When he graduated from his, from his formal training, um, he, uh, he decided that he did not want to teach, rather he wanted to be a gilder because that way he could be by himself and he could support his, uh, his work as an artist. <coughs> so sub, summing up what he refers to as Fitzgerald's stubborn and obsessive quest, Sinclair Hitchings likens his life to a pilgrimage. The direction, of course, was, uh, was Fitzgerald's own, and he had his own compass. The richness of an inner life was not going to yield to success commercially in galleries and exhibitions, and so he backed away from it. Sinclair once again opines that the spirit of Fitzgerald might be saying in his ear, you're not going to pin a label on me, just say I was my own man. This going to be okay. I was going to be my own man, he says. Which he was, of course. Well, some final thoughts before closing. Uh, when I was involved with this work, there used to be, and there was, not exactly a tension, but there was a recognized difference between uh, what was a regional artist and what might be considered uh, one who was a national, had a national reputation. Uh, Edward Rowell, the director of the Plattsburgh State uh, Art Museum, and who, uh, who had worked for years in commercial galleries in Manhattan. Uh, hinted at this in the documentary uh, that was done on Fitzgerald when he said, he's now in the literature, you can see him standing there, uh, he said, uh, and will he escape to further recognition? Time will tell. Okay. 
It occurred to me as a question years ago whether Fitzgerald's individuality in his life and his work held him back from that acclaim, as well as having, as well as his having withdrawn from public viewings. Uh, in the end, it wouldn't have mattered. It would never have mattered to him. The inner life for this man seemed to be parallel, paramount, and it came to be more so. Uh, and the works that emanated it reflected their own subject and visual language. In the years since the book, something has come about which helped soften the edges between this, this regional and national difference. And that's the way of looking seriously at the local talent and elevating their intrinsic worth in the field. Um, Jim, um, well, another, I want to say this again, a fine example of this is right here in, in, uh, on the island in Robert uh, Stahl's catalog resume. Jim certainly did have some influence on other artists, really, and Neil Brooks and Michael Vermette are two of them that are currently uh, uh, represented by the Lupin Gallery. Fitzgerald did not want to be called a regional artist. He did not want to be called a main artist uh, uh, either. Uh, but it's kind of tough to escape, actually, uh, when you are still a representational artist, not totally abstract, um, and uh, you're, you're somehow linked to local subject matter. But perhaps Jim's thinking was intended to be more universal, um, but, but that's something that it is, is a debate. After all, his quest for essentials was that and nothing less. Uh, and so to my last point, one has the sense that in especially paying tribute to this artist's work, you cannot forget the man. His life certainly had something, some unique qualities. His philosophy distinguishes him, although Asian thinking and meditative practices had grown greatly in the half century since Fitzgerald's death and have affected many artists, I'm sure. It would still seem rare in the West for an artist to wake up hours before dawn and read and contemplate in preparation for readying the spirit to be able to melt with the spiritual forces outside. Who, like him, stands for hours looking out into nature, arms crossed, meditating and picking up the spirit coming through water, rocks, light, trees, and beyond. Am I saying this just because he was a Western artist with an Eastern soul? Perhaps. Is there a similar Western philosophy? Might we look at Cezanne? And it's kind of hard to say. Cezanne certainly had a spiritual quality about him. But I would think that the difference here is that Cezanne is more akin to Platonic beauty than it is to an Asian sensitivity. In some, the totality of Fitzgerald's life and sensing it in his work, that's in front of us. And that's worth taking note of. Spirituality does not in itself make one a better artist. And I surely do not mean to say that he is better, a better artist than others, uh, either on Monhegan or elsewhere. It is simply that in his work, more than most artists, these qualities of man's inner life are reflected. His uniqueness is intriguing, much of it coming from and being embroidered with his life on this island. And I feel especially blessed to have been a small part of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs>